Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today is episode 14 of Ask Me Anything, Ask Me Anything with Abhijit Ayer, Doran Mitra. Abhijit, welcome to P Guru's channel. Veil, veil, vetri veil, and thanks for having me here as usual. And it's a pleasure to have you on our channel, Abhijit. And we have a lot of questions from the last week, which we'll be taking up first. And then we will be taking up today's questions. Please keep them coming. Abhijit has promised to, uh, you know, devote full 90 minutes of his time for this hangout, to which for which I'm very thankful to you, Abhijit. But before we start this uh, uh, Q&A session, I just would like all of us to listen to a small teaser on the rivers of India by my good friend, Dr. Kanik Skanikeshwaran. The link to the complete song is available as part of the description of this video. I would encourage each and every one of you to feel proud about the beautiful rivers that India has and to enjoy this music absolutely out of the world. Here is the teaser. And there you go. We are back. And Abhijit, before we jump into the Q&A part, um, today news comes that the Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir had his Twitter handle suspended and then Twitter coming back, backpedaling, saying that there was a mistake and they are restoring this. Now, for far too many times, these kinds of mishaps are happening on Twitter, intentionally or unintentionally. Do you know some people who work at Twitter? Is there some mischief going on? What are your thoughts? Look, let's put it this way. The kind of people Twitter hires is not somebody you'd want in your living room. Uh, if you're a halfway sane person. So, uh, no, I don't. But, uh, you know, the problem here is uh, it, it's okay for it to happen once, maybe even twice. But then when it happens over and over and over again, it means you're not putting in place the management practices required to correct it. Right. That is problematic. That then indicates it's not uh, 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 a continuing lackadaisicalness. It's actually continuing intent. I think they're gearing up for 2024 when they're going to start banning a heck of a lot of accounts starting by end 2023. That's really unfortunate should that happen. But... We, we can't dictate to Twitter. All we can do is find some alternatives. But we are thankful that Twitter is allowing us to continue to uh, webcast there, this. There is actually a lot you can do. The point is the government is too, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, craving white man approval to do anything. Because remember, uh, this, uh, it, it was uh, Trump who introduced Section 230 to give these chaps blanket immunity, and then they brought him down. They keep testing and prodding you to see weakness. And when they realize you are incapable of coming back, because even after all the riots that they promoted, if uh, it has gone off to the extent that they refuse to take down posts that uh, incite riots, but then apply their own rules to who incited a riot and take down Trump, then you clearly know there's a problem brewing at Twitter. This will be used against you. This will be weaponized against you. And it says a lot about our government that they don't give a damn. Well, uh, that's that's what it is. So let's jump into questions, Abhijit. Pramod Ramatmajan. Pramod Ramatmajan wants to know, our government is manned by product of reservation and influence peddling with utter contempt for merit. Can we expect this system to counter our challenges? Look, even reservation and influence peddling are not bad. Okay, and I'll tell you why. First of all, remember the IAS exam hardly has any reservation in it. They refuse to implement proper reservation in uh, uh, government posts and things like that, number one. Uh, uh, but even if it, they did, it wouldn't actually be an issue as long as you had provided mid-career training 
and brought in accountability measures. Same with, with influence peddling. Remember when America became a superpower, when Britain became a superpower, all, especially at the height of the British expansion, every single office in Britain was a purchased office. You had to purchase your commission. You had to know somebody. It was open bribery. It wasn't even illegal. And they still became the greatest empire on earth. So remember, this is not about reservation and this is not about influence peddling. You can actually run a top-notch government even through influence peddling and uh, reservation. If you bring in through career training, you bring in proper checks and balances and you bring in proper uh, accountability measures. So don't confuse cause and effect. Next question from Aryendra Singh. When Dalits or Muslims are killed, it is made a hot topic on the internet by people. But today, this is last week, five BJP workers were killed and no reaction till yet. People who talk about humanity become blind here. Why? Because it's all politics for them. But imagine... Even your own PM doesn't tweet about it. He has time to tweet about Shabana Azmi's broken nose, but not about his own uh, people killed. So, you know, people take cues. The right is never willing to stand up for its own. Uh, the BJP only remembers the workers killed when it comes to elections. Before the elections, when they get killed, they don't give a damn. Immediately after the elections, what did the BJP do? They sent JP Nadda on a, a private business jet, smiling. If you actually look at that photo of him in a private business jet, he's smiling from year to year. You can see the smile under his mask. So they don't take, see, they've got this karyakarta mentality. If you are uh, volunteering, I am doing you a favor. So this is what comes out of it. Yes, and, and on all those IT cell guys who are watching this program, you know, we don't hold back our punches, especially Abhijit. Nada. And, Look, the uh, only thing the IT cell can do, please remember, they're a bunch of chakkas. The only thing they can do is tweet. Okay, and most of them can't even get their English right. Forget English, they can't even get their Hindi bloody right. Okay, na? Or to kuch kar nahi sakte hai. To chodo. They're third raters wallowing in third ratedness. Um, Raj to Sheku. Was Modi worse for the economy on over a long time, in, in a long time period? Many people voted for Modi to carry on economic reforms, but considering present scenario, will Modi lose the next time? Guys, you have to work on your English when you ask questions. I can't edit it and ask at the same time. Please go ahead. Look, uh, I think it will. It's going to affect uh, whatever reforms he's done. And mind you, he's done some fairly decent reforms so far. Had he not walked back the farm laws or allowed a two-year uh, gestation period or whatever. Uh, it was necessary to go through. The problem is we're not seeing the ground implementation of those reforms. NRCCA, we're not seeing implementation of it. Uh, let's see what happens. No, I don't think he will lose the next election. In fact, I can guarantee he's going to win the next election. And I'll tell you why. Three years is a very long time in politics, number one. Number two, if you remember, Indira Gandhi lost in 77 and she came back with, with her biggest majority ever in 1980. That was also three years. So three years, people tend to forget. Also, remember, the mortality rate isn't that high. Losing four or 5,000 people a day the personal effect on people isn't that great, boss. Two, we lose between 200 to 400,000 people a year, two, two to four lakh people a year on uh, on TB. Do you see anybody lose elections because of that? We've only lost over a, over over two lakh people now to uh, Corona. So even if it goes up to four lakhs, you're not going to see any great uh, pushback, number one. Number two, in order for him to lose, um, I think who said this? Uh, was it Sanjay Baru? No. Uh, who was it? I forget. Nana Falkiwala, I think, who said this, that Indian governments don't win elections, but Indian governments lose elections. So, um, uh, yes, it's not either of them. Uh, but in a, in a talk of Sanjay Baru with Dr. Swami, he mentioned the correct name. Go back and look at that. Please go ahead. So what happens with that is, that, you know, in order for the opposition to win, they have to unite. They have to create a certain uh, uh, 
uh, narrative. You have to have, if there is disaffection, you need to create a credible pool so that for that disaffection to be positively directed towards. They are not going to do that. Because remember, with their string of victories, they're going to win and they're probably going to win UP as well uh, uh, next year. You're going to see that there's going to be no room left for uh, uh, compromise between all of them. They're all going to be on a high. They're not going to see the consolidated threat. I can tell you right now that Mamta is not going to give up leadership of uh, this thing to anyone. If when it comes to opposition sharing talks, depending on how the SP does in UP, she will say, boss, I am the uh, I have one more. Technically, I have one more greater footprint of Lok Sabha seats than all of you. So I'm going to be the leader. And I can honestly tell you, if it's Rahul Gandhi is projected as the leader, they're going to go nowhere. He couldn't even take his party to uh, triple digits. Where is he going to take the opposition to triple digits? So it requires a lot of things. Um, the next question is from Ritu Patil. By the way, viewers, we are covering the questions that were asked in the last Hangout that we could not get to. We have a few more questions and then we will get to today's questions. Thank you. Ritu Patil wants to know how to make BJP listen. They only seem to be concerned about elections, yet we have no choice. Should we vote INC just to make them wake up? Vote for whoever is a credible opposition just to make them wake up. But I'm afraid even that is not going to have an effect. Because understand there was a BJP before 2014, which had a lot of micro balancing happening within it because there were lots of leaders you could approach. It was like an open door policy. You could go talk to anybody. They would all listen to you. After 2014, there is no such thing as the BJP. There is only the Modi Janta Party which is built on the ruins of the former BJP. There is no BJP left. All its checks and balances have been destroyed. All the micro balancing between the leaders has been destroyed. There is only one leader who listens to nobody except his IAS Babus. That's it. So if you want to go after anyone, uh, you know, go after Modi, but he's not going to listen because they're not going to let anything filter in through them. If you go after Babus, he listens do they are completely unaccountable so nothing's going to happen to them either uh, if you talk to the other leaders they're completely powerless so there's no point going after them if you go vote for Rahul Gandhi Rahul Gandhi is actually worse than uh, Modi because Modi at least listens to electioneering Rahul doesn't even listen to that he keeps losing elections and he sees no no uh, 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 no need to course correct at all has he changed his behavior? No. Has he changed his campaigning? No. Has he changed all the uh, nasty vitriol he keeps spewing 24-7? No. So that's Abhijit, that. Um, Abhijit, I want us to take a step back and look at the BJP uh, performance in Bengal. Now, if you look at their percentage of vote share, right, they only lost about 2% from 2019, yet they lost a lot of seats. And that perhaps means that people who are traditional Congress voters, CPIM voters, chose to vote for Trinamool Congress instead. Why do you think that happened? Uh, see, there was significant vote transfer actually from the CPI and the INC to the BJP as well. The issue was that the uh, TMC uh, vote percentage was already high and it got topped up by another 3 to 4 percent. So the differential became much greater. Right. So if you look at it, the CPI is down to 4.5 percent. The Congress is down to 3 percent. That is Congress is down 9 percent and uh, CPI is down 15 percent from last time. So that's very significant. It's very significant. Plus the ISF. See, there was uh, you would have seen the Adivasis and Dalits. They voted overwhelmingly for the BJP, 60, 60, uh, 58, 60 percent each. But you look at the Muslim vote, it was 90, 98 percent consolidation. So th there's no way you're going to overcome a consolidation like that when they're about 30 to 40 percent of your population. Now, see, uh, I, this is actually played out in uh, Tamil Nadu also, you know, uh, Annamalai's election, there was a booth in Palapati area where 572 votes were cast and he got only one vote. The remember the remaining 571 went to DMK. But this kind of 
across the board polarization doesn't augur well for the minority community also don't you think obviously i think it's very bad for them but they don't seem to get it see they don't get it because they go on voting instead of creating spreading your uh, like you know if you come into capital as in financial capital what you do is you hedge your bets you invest in a lot of things so that even if say 50 60% of it make you bankrupt the remaining 40% at least will make profit <coughs> here they're not they're following follow, falling for this completely polarized discourse bjp is a threat bjp is a threat bjp is a threat bjp is a threat and they're narrowing their votes down to a few parties which the more and more it gets narrowed down actually makes it a very ripe plucking for asaduddin owaisi to come and get it remember asaduddin even though he didn't make a dent in bengal this time he didn't make a dent at all in bengal he will make a dent in another 5 to 10 years you keep watching and he's going to capture that entire vote and at that point you will have the entire muslim vote in this country centered around just one party which will make it extremely easy to isolate and disempower completely but look i mean if that is their great uh, uh, strategy there's nothing we can do about it uh, next question from sanjit mishra the oxygen crisis has exposed a soft logistics underbelly any thoughts on how external inimical powers can exploit this there is no exploitation by external powers remember what it was was that uh the oxygen that you have we have we have enough oxygen both for our industrial uh plants as well as for all the medical plants required the problem wasn't even as we are discovering now one of transport to cities it was more a case of logistics marshaling of finding the big tankers that would go on to trucks and uh, railway uh, uh, carriages to take them to those cities number one nobody accounted for it whoever was doing the calculations was just looking at oxygen hai ha huh. uh, uh, demand kitna hoga so much and therefore we matched up they went looking at the transportation the third hiccup was the actual cylinders the smaller cylinders where you fill up the small cylinders so the final mile the last mile connectivity uh, 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 what you call the last mile of connectivity there we didn't have enough cylinders right so it was getting a lot of these things now technically because our industry our steel industry all these oxygen plants are co-located with our steel industry and they are uh, 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 they supply those steel plants every single day you assume that there is logistical capacity as in the amount of large containers to transport that oxygen to where it is required right so it it wasn't even a uh, uh, the availability of the large plants it was a last mile connectivity failure and it was a failure of marshaling those uh, large uh, transport uh, modules for it so there's no scope there for the enemy if you call them whoever it would be to actually exploit this next question is from jitendra julka hi abhijit my son is extremely interested in geopolitics and ir as career options he is interested in the ifs can you guide on alternate career options in the same field such as a think tank etc okay there's several uh one is you can go into risk consultancy uh then you can go into think tanks and they usually all if you're a good think tanker you get lots of risk consultancy projects so that's important for you to realize that they're both interconnected then there's a whole career in academics as well which pays very very well uh so uh, if he wants to spend his life just doing academic research into ir and geopolitics that's also a fantastic career option uh, uh and of course there's government advisories abroad not in india because in india that turf is very uh, clearly protected by the ifs and things like that so you've got at least three different career options think about it you can also become a journalist you know you can become a journalist specializing just in foreign policy 
Thank you for that. Kunal Kumar wants to know, recently the DRDO has said to be developing crystal blade technology. What is your take on that? Crystal Congratulations. Blade Best of luck. That is more of your, uh, I, I want you to take a video of a jet engine starting up on afterburner and you see all that fire coming out of its ass. That is all your tax rupees going down that ass. It's literally being burnt down the ass. Imagine Japan hasn't been able to come up with that technology by itself. It had to get it transferred. Uh, Russia hasn't been able to come up with proper technology like that. Their crystal blade technology is extremely uh, 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 poor. Uh, China's crystal blade technology is even poorer. Right. And China has a much bigger industrial base than Russia. So you're telling me that we can come up with this technology where much richer, much bigger, much bigger budget countries have failed. What am I not seeing out here? So best of luck. I mean, I wish them all luck uh, as long as it was their retirement funds they were using. Unfortunately, they're not. They're using my taxes. That's true. And the next question is from Mr. Lee. After denying center's request for COVID task force in um, April, SC suddenly set up a task force. What do you think of this panel with zero representation from oxygen producers slash logistics providers? I never take SC panels very seriously at all. I would suggest you don't either. Next question. Same Mr. Lee. Why can't government of India allow Pfizer, Moderna to vaccinate Indians who can afford it? The vaccines could be provided directly at airports because India lacks number of ultra cold dry ice thermal containers. Absolutely. And here's the thing. W tell me what specific requirement did you want? Do Indians have purple blood? Are we evolved from a different species of human being? Did Homo erectus uh, uh, have some other secret species that came into India and became Homo sapiens here and the, uh, where Europeans der derived from some other branch of Homo erectus? So clearly, if it's been given clearance out there, why do you want it to go through another set of clearance out here? You understand how human testing works. Right? It doesn't have to work across all races and things. But this is what we're stuck with. They should have, look, there were many balls that were missed. First, you should have advanced booked your vaccines. You need to have advanced booked them a full year in advance. And mind you, this is the same thing that happens in defense. They don't understand economies of scale. In defense, you go and place an order for just 80 Tejas instead of saying, look, I know it's not a great plane, but I'm going to place an order for 600 Tejas so that we create economies of scale. It gives the entire industrial ecosystem, key, at least for 600 planes, I will have guaranteed contracts. You needed to do that because see the mRNA uh, uh, vaccine processing that is done. It is the first time mRNA vaccines are being manufactured in such scale across the world. Okay, China is not able to develop it. Their vaccine is not mRNA based. So it tells you how critical this thing is. You should have put in all your money up front and said we want to buy. There's a total uh, vaccinable population of about, say, 800 million. We need 1.6 billion doses. We need those 1.6 billion doses delivered by XYZ. This is the amount of money we are willing to pay. Who wants to bid for it? That's it. They did. They went into this uh, Atman Nirbar Bharat bullshit, etc., etc., etc. And this is what you end up getting. This was mistake number one. Mistake number two, like I said, you want to uh, every vaccine to uh, go through the process of testing in India again when it has been approved with countries with far more rigorous testing than you. If Pfizer was playing games with you, what happened to all the other vaccines? Johnson & Johnson you could have approved. Moderna you could have approved. The Sputnik you could have approved earlier. No, you didn't. 
so there's been consistent mismanagement over and over and over again we got into this comfort zone thinking because by uh, uh, december january it had completely petered off we thought ha huh, now what is the point now we can do whatever we want then there was the issue of price control and the moment you had price controls and things like that not giving them extra capital how were they going to size up so you came in late you didn't order you set up all kinds of bureaucratic traps and then you set up price traps as well it is criminal malfeasance criminal next question from mr lee again how far away is india from a free trade agreement with the eu after pm modi's weekend talks do you think the pmo was distracted from domestic matters owing to this eu meeting look first of all i can tell you from everything i've heard in the eu that it uh, in private remember in public they have to say something in private they have to say some, uh, th their opinion is something else so in uh, public they are very um, yes yes we're going to have a free trade agreement etc etc in public they've given up in private they've given up hope on any kind of fta with india it's simply not going to happen so if this man was distracted or not it really doesn't matter next question uh, eoni protocol hindutva future sunni relation with other communities in 30 years mahabharat and ramayana in saudi how much muslim population in india is influenced by saudis quite a bit actually uh because remember uh, in india all the influential muslim communities are shia are uh, the economically influential uh the uh, uh electorally influential ones are the uh, uh uh sunnis and there's been a significant spread of uh saudi uh, uh money to those communities and you know it's very interesting to watch what is happening there curiously enough uh i think bernard hekel writes a lot about it you will see that where saudi money is going it's actually moderating the muslims they actually believe in certain constitutional values not that they pro bjp or anything we shouldn't confuse pro bjp with being constitutional but they tend to be quite constitutional they tend to be very very pious but also very constitutional uh, well i mean relatively on the other hand you find that a lot of the sort of native breeds the barelvis the deobandis and those people they are the ones that tend to be quite extreme including a lot of the sufi houses right so um my fear always was at one point of time even though you could see that the saudi houses were kind of more had some kind of faith in the constitution they were much more internationalist incidentally they had a much greater awareness of what was happening in the world uh, compared to some of the indian denominations what you find is that uh, my fear was that they could be weaponized by the saudis at some point in the future now with the saudi indian rapprochement complete there is no scope for them being weaponized later on so right now it's okay it's all good next question from him how is it anthropologically possible for third world india to develop covaxin when when will india reach 5 trillion in economy with or without covid uh 5 trillion in economy i think uh, modi was talking about 5 trillion cents in which case we've already reached the 5 trillion cent mark uh i think we reached the 5 trillion cents long back no <laughs> that's true but uh, there are there are so, many ways to look at it uh, vijit if you let the indian currency float it might happen sooner than you think it's not going to happen because look their way of controlling the economy uh they fall into this trap where they think verbosity is good policy where is good policy should be no more than one page long it has to be easy it has to allow the maximum possible uh uh interpretation in favor of the manufacturer not in favor of the government 
okay you're still the last seven arbitrations that india has held that india has lost india has refused to implement the decisions right so they and we've lost seven arbitrations in a row so far and we've refused to implement those decisions so you're not a very attractive investment uh, this thing your regulatory mechanisms are a joke your uh, law and order mechanisms are a joke you are not a very uh, uh, this thing now after covid there is going to be some spurt in growth this is natural because you know when the economy comes down that much when natural economic activity picks up it is going to spurt you're going to see growth of about 12 13% in some years which is a good thing right it's it's recovering from all that the, all that you lost but uh is it really going to ever realistically take off no now how did india come up with something like covaxin it's because remember the uh vaccine the generic pharmaceutical sector has been left alone since pv narsimha rao's time they have built up if you look at the pharmaceutical exports they started as a trickle under narsimha rao they became bigger under vajpai they absolutely started steamrollering under manmohan singh we have created a niche capacity number 1 it was one of those areas where the government thankfully didn't poke its nose in too much because it needed these vaccines to deliver its own socialistic uh, sort of programs of uh, med medicine equity and things like that so it allowed these companies to flourish it was a big export revenue uh, owner so uh, earner so it happened and remember these are the things where you can actually create pockets pockets of excellence you can't create a spread of excellence but you can create certain pockets of excellence which is why we were able to develop it's just the same way now look developing a vaccine is a single silo developing a plane is not a silo because developing a plane requires the same kind of uh effort across several silos you have to develop the airframe you have to develop the materials for the airframe that is another silo you have to develop the electronics which is another silo you have to develop the radar which is a completely different silo you have to develop the electronic jamming systems which is a completely different silo you have to develop the engine which is a completely different silo you have to develop the weapons which is a completely different silo so there's at least seven silos i've listed there's probably about 20 30 more silos where you need several you need 30 40 versions of your pharmaceutical industry to come up with a cogent claim whereas pharmaceuticals is a single silo it's the same reason we're very good in space because space is a single silo and of course isro and uh, 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 um pharma are two sides of the same coin uh, isro is a case of because it came under direct prime ministerial control because of its uh, implications for the ballistic missile program it was very well managed uh, pharma became very well managed precisely because the government didn't touch it because it was a cash cow so either it is managed through the prime minister's office in a semi competent way or it is managed in an extremely competent way without any government interference you can't have management by babus sachin patel wants to know with a lockdown in most states the police are back to harassing people unnecessarily the regional media celebrates this your view on what should be done there's nothing we can do remember in the when there was this sense of uh, um you know national unity i guess where uh, everybody said yeah yeah we need this etc 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 let's go along with this it's very important so actually you found that even when i used to go out during the lockdown uh, with permission the police wouldn't harass you they'd be very sweet they'd be very polite they'd want to know where you're going they'd ask for proof and that was it now the police harassment has gone through the roof because of all the extra pass that were given to them 
even during the unlock phase, their harassment went through the roof. And right now it has gone through the roof. The police extortion racket has gone through the roof. Right. Why? This is very important to understand why. This is how conflict economies work. Initially, when you start lockdowns, and we've seen this in Kashmir, right? You start lockdowns, curfews, uh, military operations and things like counterinsurgency operations. The first three months, everything goes well. After that, what happens is the entire economy adjusts to the new normal, which is black marketing, profiteering, etc., etc., etc. And so what ends up happening is that you have this whole economic realignment towards illegality. We have seen this in virtually every country that has come under sanctions or that has been a conflict uh, economy. Uh, we see this in Afghanistan. We see this in Iran. We see this in Bosnia even today. Albania is rife with it. Uh, uh, Croatia has somehow managed to control it. Uh, but, uh, you know, in every other conflict zone, it takes 30, 40 years to deconflict an economy. In Kashmir, we haven't even started the process of deconflicting the economy which is why whatever we gained through the abrogation of 370 has already been lost. Right? Because there were follow-up steps needed, which were never taken. So what you've seen is, you've seen the economy transform to a, because the longer draconian measures continue, the less their efficacy becomes. The entire economy has realigned, and because lockdowns are now the norm, that same coercive, the thulla mentality, so to say, is all pervasive. Plus, there's a lot of black marketing and racketeering going around. Shailesh Latkar wants to know, but Dr. Swami, China has started to amass at our borders. Should we expect a long showdown like the last time or is something more dangerous afoot? Something more dangerous is afoot. The point is we don't know what is afoot. We can see what's happening and it's not on the borders. It's in fact about 150, 200 kilometers inside the border. See, you need to separate uh, temporary blips in troop numbers on the border with the ability to sustain war deep inside the border. Deep inside the border, what is happening is what worries me. What is happening on the border doesn't worry me yet. But they are building a long-term war waging capacity out there. I don't know when it is going to be used. I suspected it was going to be used sometime around March, April, um, which if you remember in the same program uh, last year, we had discussed what that something was imminent. But now it is going to take, uh, we don't know what form it's going to take. <coughs> the good thing is, if something happens, we're keeping a very close watch with satellites and we'll be able to tell you at least 24 to 48 hours in advance. That's great. Next question is, if you were made the foreign affairs czar for India, what structural changes would you make? Or are we so far gone that things cannot be fixed? There's nothing that cannot be fixed. The question is, do you have the political capital and the financial capital to fix it? With the foreign service, you eminently have the capital to fix it. Now, let me tell you what you need to do. This foreign minister has presided over not the expansion of the foreign service, but the contraction of the foreign service. We came down to 700 plus diplomats to 600 uh, plus diplomats when you needed a significant expansion. What you need is you need your foreign ministry expanded to about 3000, number one from the current 680 odd. So you need almost a five fold expansion. Now, <clears throat> you may find it very surprising that somebody like me, who's always been for small government, is advocating for uh, uh, expansion. This is a very critical function. It's an intelligence gathering function. Uh, so it's very important. First, you expand it to around 3000. Second, what you need to do is you need to have strict checks and balances in embassies. Ambassadors shouldn't be allowed to behave the way they are. There need to be strict codes of what are the tangibles that they have to deliver. And then there has to be a clear transmission of information from ambassador to successor, from political counselor to next political counselor. Because what happens out here is when a new political counselor comes, their contacts and things aren't handed over. There has to be a handover period where your successor signs 
of saying he is satisfied with the complete handover of contacts and introductions that the previous political counselor has made failing which the previous political counselor will not be given any promotion you also need to have a pyramidal structure right now it's a structure like this if you get into the foreign service you will become ambassador you will become joint secretary you can't allow that okay it has to become a pyramid wherein at every stage you end up sacking at least 5% of your workforce at every uh, 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 promotion you have to end up sacking 5% of your workforce till then these people won't work and that's very very important and, and uh, most I... importantly you need them to be taking massive mid career training programs there also needs to be fundamental grooming standards grooming and uh, you know there's that lady that there's that uh, parsi lady who runs uh, uh, etiquette classes <clears throat> she was very famous she used to run etiquette classes for femina miss world i forget you, you know who i'm talking about na i think I so think she, I, I, the name she, rings a bell something padamsi not alik alik pearl padamsi pearl padamsi was it pearl no pearl padamsi also died no it was some other lady yes yes huh? alik is a male pearl is a lady But and, Pearl uh, Padamsi also died, no? She died yeah, long yeah, back. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think uh, so. Th this is another lady. She uh, uh, she looks a lot like Maureen Wardia with a bob cut. I forget her name, but she runs these grooming classes for uh, grooming and etiquette classes for uh, uh, Miss India contestants. You need to contract her out to teach these some of these people some grooming and etiquette, especially. when you are taking somebody like an ambassador out for lunch to uh, pump him or her for information you can't take them out to mcdonalds <laughs> so true i, I kid you not i kid you not a deputy ambassador of india wanted to take my friend in dc out for dinner to a mcdonalds Very sad. So um, I agree with you about the five percent attrition because that is how you maintain top quality and also keep the people who are remaining on their toes to be better at what they do. This happens routinely in many high tech companies where the five percent or the lowest performer five percent are usually shown the door. So um, thanks for that. And the next question from Shailesh Latkar. which five objectives should a new economically right wing party espouse to bring back india to the path of double digit growth and security with respect to china which right wing what should we espouse party let's say you start a new right wing party today there's nothing optimally blank, blank slate he's he is giving you a blank slate how do you plan it restart the swatantra party <laughs> restart the swatantra party you need a certain dose of elitism you need a certain dose of social mobility you need an end to this toxic socialism you need a celebration of wealth um viewers for those of you who don't know what swatantra party is or was it was started by chakravarti rajagopalachari i think once he left uh tamu uh the congress so here is the interesting story he was the first indian born governor general of india we all know that because we read it in our history books then what happened was in 1950 from 19 once he finished that from 1948 to 1950 i think he was a minister without portfolio the euphemism being he was a peacekeeper between patel and nehru and then once patel passed away um raja ji became the home minister now he should have been somebody in the center but nehru didn't like him because he saw him as a power center so what happened was there was a lot of friction between the two and somewhere something interesting happened and raja ji ended up being the chief minister of tamil nadu <laughs> he was not elected by the way he just got helicoptered in there and then he started this very controversial thing where he said it was called kulak kalvi tittam which is those families who were you know traditionally artisans of a certain craft he said that in the morning you take classes for education in the afternoon you take classes to improve what trade craft that you have learnt over generations 
Unfortunately, this became the lightning rod for the Dravida movement to oppose it. Then it morphed into linguistic movement. Then Madras had to be sp split into multiple states, Karnataka, part of it went into Kerala, Andhra Pradesh and so on. And I think it was whittling down this guy's power. And suddenly Rajaji found himself in a small state and he had to actually resign when the guy who asked for a separate Andhra Pradesh died. Sorry to give you a lamba chada answer. But then what happened was Rajaji parted company with Congress and he formed the Swaraja party. Who were the backers of the Swaraja party? These were the kings and princes and princesses who were, you know, completely taken out of the power equation in 1947. But they were enjoying what is called as a privy purse. So they had some money given by the government of India for their maintenance. So they were relatively wealthy at that point and they were seeking that, you know, they have to have some political expression. So they all were the backers of Swatantra. Swatantra tasted excellent success in 1967 Lok Sabha elections where they are number two. After Congress, they were the most powerful uh, opposition. They were the opposition party, but they were also be able, they were also able to form governments in several states at that point of time. However, in 1969, Indira Gandhi uh, abolished Privy Purse and then took off. One of the reasons for giving the Privy Purse was that these princes and princesses and kings and queens, they could not contest elections in India because they were afraid that India would slide back into uh, kingdom rule. So, but what she did in 1969, <coughs> she abolished Privy Purse and then said, okay, now you can contest elections. But we have to remember there was a 22 year disconnect in terms of what the kings and queens could do to reach out to their praja. So that made it completely, you know, impossible for Swaraja to have its own funding coffers. Those things went away and slowly Swaraja, you know, melted away. So this is a party that was avowed right wing. It was, it had very good principles and, and Rajaji was a very good statesman. Unfortunately, he didn't know the knack of winning elections. I don't know if he even contested, but be that as it may, it's a good history lesson. So those of you who want to go more can read up on Swatantra party. Pilu Modi, Minu Masani, there were a lot of intellectuals that comprised this party at one point of time. But you want to add also, something to that? Abhijit? Also to remember uh, two, three different things. One, it was the Swatantra party, not the Swarajya party. I keep making Oh, did I say Swarajya? Yeah, Swatantra. Yeah. 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 Swarajya was the magazine which has been yes. restarted. Uh, Swatantra was the party. I also yes. keep confusing that, number one. Number two, you have to look at uh, this party was full of intellectual giants. Never forget that. These people were giants. If, if they saw what right wing thought in India today has been reduced to, that Pushpaka Vimana was actually the Boeing 787 in uh, 5000 BC, uh, they would have committed collective suicide. Uh, they, they would have no room for the kind of buffoonery that passes off as right-wingism in India today, number two. Number three, look at the decline even in their own ranks. Minu Masani's son is a joke. He teaches somewhere in England, he's a joke. Uh, uh, Raj Gopalachari's grandson is Praveen Chakravarti who did the app for uh, the Congress. Okay, uh, so th there's been a significant intellectual decline there as well, uh, which shows you that the second generation. Well, what about Raj about... Mohan Gandhi? I'm just saying he's also a grandson of Raja Ji think... and Mahatma Gandhi. Well, I mean, you tell me what's so great about him. No, he's a writer. He fancies himself to be an intellectual. Well, he fancies himself. I don't know who else fancies him. Um, so best of luck to him. Uh, so, you know, there's been a huge intellectual degradation out there as well. The problem is that, unfortunately, today the right wing is stuck with a lot of very stupid uh, uh, nonsense and gobbledygook. Uh, there is no economic right wing at all, whereas this was a staunchly economic right wing party, whereas today what passes off as the right wing is just saffron communists. Y you basically have the hammer and sickle. You don't have the lotus, you have the hammer and sickle, but it has a... The color, they took a little bit of haldi, threw it on a red flag and the uh, resulting shade was saffron. That's it. Lal me thoda chuna laga diya. Well, lal me thoda haldi me la diya bas. 
<laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. Um, next question is a new member. Will China break up and collapse due to debt, declining population, local dissent, hostility from multiple fronts such as Taiwan, India and Hong Kong? Not in my lifetime, possibly not in yours either. It's impossible, boss. They've, they've, the way they've homogenized, they never made this mistake that the USSR did of creating heterogeneous republics within the country. Okay, and their drive at homogenization is next level. The only people that, who seem to have been able to resist it so far up to a point are Tibetans and much more so the Uyghurs. Even the Tibetans, if you actually go to Tibet, this entire Tibet movement is highly uh, uh, overspoken about because, you know, almost 50% of Tibetans, even in Tibet today, are intermarried with Chinese. Next 10, 15 years, another 50% on top of that, so it'll become 75%. And finally, the entire Tibetan cultural identity will be wiped out. So there'll be nothing left. The Uyghurs will be much more resistant because Islam proves to be uniquely resistant to this kind of thing, which is why, you know, Islam is quite admirable in that sense. They don't really allow uh, uh, that kind of integration to happen uh, anymore in the modern world. They did allow it to happen in Central Asia with the USSR. The USSR actually succeeded in completely wiping out their Central Asian identity. So today, all the identity of uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan and uh, 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 Kazakhstan is a rediscovered identity to such an extent that they didn't even speak their own languages till they got independence. Nam ke vaste, they used to learn it, but they could speak as good Kazakh or Turkmen or Uzbek as you or I could after three years of learning German in school. Wow. Um, next question. Hey, I wanted to ask you as a follow up. You know, have you heard of the Epoch Times? Yes. Now, Epoch Times considers itself as a right wing, and I think rightly so. Uh, in in the in the United States, they also publish a newspaper, very thriving online edition, and this is more or less the voice of the Falun Gong in Tibet. What do you think of the Falun Gong? Because they are uh, about vegetarians, they are Buddhists. And, and they are hanging out, isn't it? They are toughing it out. Falun Gong are one of the few. They're wonderful people. They're, uh, I know a lot of members of the Falun Gong. They're very, very... They believe in principles. They believe in certain principles like kindness and things like that, which the Chinese state has forgotten. So it's uh, uh, crushed. But, you know, how long can they survive? See, they've given a theological, the, the importance of Falun Gong for me was that, you know, uh, uh, um, Taoism and uh, Confucianism and Chinese religion, if you look at it, the Chinese have traditionally never been very religious. Have you noticed? They, they don't really have a theology. It's more about rituals and things like that. It's very much like the old Roman and Greek religions were. It's religion to suit the needs of the state. Falun Gong, for the first time, introduced a great theological depth to it, which is very popular with emigre Chinese, but it's being wiped out in China proper. A few are still holding out, I guess, in, uh, outside it's of... It's a secret, uh, yeah. but you can't do it for very long. You know, one of the admirable things about the Epoch Times, and those of you who can read it, do read it. I think they have a free subscription, if I remember correctly. It's a good magazine because they brought out so many stories about China, especially about the virus and things like that. Very professionally presented data. Very, very good. I mean, that that's what I can tell you. I mean, it's more sensible to read that for right-wing views in the United States than some of the avowed right-wing publications like Fox Business, for example, or Fox News. You know, it's, it's up and down. You never know what you're going to get. At least with, with Epoch Times, you know this is the right-wing view and they are fairly consistent about it. I'm sorry to take a segue. I just thought that we should talk about this also. Um, next question is from Ritu Patil. How to put a check on the judiciary in this country? 
they are interfering in everything which is actually bringing their importance down. They do have the power under Section 32 of the Constitution, don't they? Who? Judiciary. Look, I mean, when the government abdicates, they invade. That's what's happening. The, and mind you, this has nothing to do with COVID either. Even during the farm protests, the government took a back seat. Okay, even before that, during the Delhi riots, when COVID wasn't a thing, the government took Yet. a back seat. Yeah. So if you abdicate your own responsibility to the Supreme Court, what the hell do you expect the Supreme Court to do? This is what we're seeing is not judicial activism. What we're seeing is a, the judiciary filling a vacuum. So much for good governance. Yeah. You know, uh, there are so many of you guys out there, blind bucks, underbucks, <laughs> some people call them gundabucks. Why don't you try and explain the masterly inactivity that was practiced by Messrs. Amit Shah and Narendra Modi when Delhi was burning, literally burning on, on during the trip of uh, Trump. So Hindu lives don't matter. There were areas where the Hindus were targeted and that rascal of a guy, Tahir Hussein, still, you know, brazens it out. And, and what about the, his boss? That guy is still around. He's, you know, spouting nonsense. I mean, th this kind of things, they have to explain. You try to, you know, run down, whether it is Abhijit or Sri Ayer or P. Gurus or Dr. Swami for something that they may or we may say, but first explain why they are being doing nothing. What is the grand uh, strategy here? Do you know, Abhijit? It's apparently called 10-dimensional chess. You see, uh, we are apparently human beings who only see the world in 3D. But uh, Modi is some... Uh, uh, he's actually the 10th incarnation of Vishnu. He's the Kalki avatar who's come and he sees 10 different dimensions. You know, they say the 4th dimension is time. But he sees the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, the ninth, 10th dimension. So he can see very, very far into the future and he's setting up uh, India for Ram Rajya to return. Well, any of you who believe that uh, I have a bridge to sell, it's called the Golden Gate. It, it's a very unique construction. Please contact me for details. Next question. Shalab Pradhan wants to know, why did the pair of upgraded Mirage 2000s, which were on bar cap, not deployed, deployed their MICA missiles in the skirmish with Park Air Force in 2019? Was it due to a faulty radar? This is very, very deep, boss. I don't understand. I'm just reading the question. You may know what really happened. They had different planes for different things. They had Sukhois, they had MiG-21s, and they had the Mirage. They'd use the Mirage for uh, the strike. And then basically these Mirages had, they were celebrating their victory. There was no intelligence. It, had there been a good intelligence warning that a Pakistani strike was imminent, they would have uh, been the first choice, but they weren't. Why? Because it was an intelligence failure that we didn't see the strike coming. So we had to use whatever planes we had on emergency standby, which were uh, the Sukhois and the uh, MiG-21s. And because the MiG-21s were the oldest, they got hit the worst. Thank you. And the next question is from Anandan Ramanathan. Why the government is not very vocal about DRDO anti-COVID medicine 2DG? Not enough coverage even in Indian media. Are we undermining ourselves? By the way, we did write First, a story about it. Please understand it isn't a anti-COVID medicine. It is a COVID recovery helper. It apparently helps you recover faster. It does not fight COVID. Please read the fine text. If you actually read all the press briefings, that's very clear. I don't know why people are going around calling it anti-COVID uh, medicine. They've also started free distribution of Ayush 64. Correct. Obviously, because nobody wants to buy it. So they're using taxpayer money to uh, sustain some uh, 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 gainful unemployment. Well, ungainful employment, ungainful government employment, sorry. So this is what happens to all your tax rupees. They didn't have the foresight to purchase 1.6 billion shots 
uh, uh, early on, but they had the foresight to, uh, you know, keep these people on in uh, jobs that are going to yield absolutely no value add to the economy. Uh, uh, Rahul Varke wants to know, why is the cigar industry in India so underdeveloped? You might know. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, Indian cigars have a problem. They're extremely rough. Uh, they're not very sophisticated. The tobacco quality hasn't improved. There's a lack of branding. Uh, there's been a lack of innovation. Uh, there's also been a lack of quality control. And mostly it has to do with the fact that none of the younger generation, remember, it reached a high under the British. Uh, Churchill used to almost exclusively smoke uh, Trichy cigars. Uh, the problem since then has been that none of the kids have had the flamboyance of flair to appreciate a good cigar. So, you know, when the owners themselves don't take any interest in those cigars, when you're not able to brand it, because cigars have become a huge status symbol, and where you are unable to equate a status symbol with it, and you're not able to produce the kind of refined tobacco required for it, single roll, you know, that, that it has to be a single leaf that gets rolled up, there should be no holes or patches in it, and you have to roll it up perfectly, there has to be a certain complexity to the tobacco. You know, in Italy, what they do is they get Dominican or Cuban leaves and they drench them in brandy. Uh, so there's these brand called Toscana, the cigarillos. They're wonderful. And they cater to a different market. And then there's the pure undiluted uh, 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 cigar market. We produce none of those. It's, it's become a stagnated industry. A lot of it is also because of all the taxes and this and that. But this was a probably an industry which you should have left to itself. But even though it has more or less kind of been left to itself, there's just never been the flair and the value addition required. And over a period of time, it's lost so much market share. There's nothing left to revitalize it now. And Indian brand used to be called Sherut. And that comes from the Tamil word surut, which is which means uh, you know folded. folded no, no, no. Uh, Ch Ch cherut is different. Cherut are is smaller cherute. cigars. Mm. Uh, the Indian brand wasn't cherut. There are several different Indian. No, no, brands. no. The the type of cigars made in India used to be called cherut. No, no. There, there used to be several. It wasn't just the cherut. The cherut is the smaller cigar surut, mm. uh, but we used to produce regular uh, mm. Cuban pipe. Cuban size cigars. Oh, the fat well. ones. Okay. The uh, fat ones. But uh, like I said, their quality is, uh, it's just horrible. Hmm. Um, I made the mistake of buying a box once. It came very highly recommended. Uh, never again. WTV wants to know, Abhijit Bhaiya, what is your take on having aircraft carriers and taking war to enemy and offense Thai, in, instead of no carrier and defending yourself and at your land. Mm, I actually wrote a very long piece about this about four or five years back. What you're talking about is called sea denial versus sea control. Sea denial is where you have everything except aircraft carriers and it's all aimed at preventing an enemy from coming and taking over your sea space. Uh, sea control is where you have sea denial plus uh, uh, aircraft carriers. Now, why, uh, and mind you, today there is no such thing as defensive because all defend, all platforms are multi-purpose. Multi so even your submarines and destroyers, which were once used in a traditionally defensive role, can be used in an offensive role. So remember, a sea denial capability can easily turn into if deployed in sufficient numbers, turn into a uh, sea control capability based on what you're up against. Aircraft carriers, wonderful idea in principle. Uh, the point is, it's not a very wise investment. Okay, because your aircraft carriers, first of all, how many aircraft carriers can you build up? And remember, an aircraft carrier is not a capital, uh, you know, it, it's got this when Indian thinking has this capital ship mentality with it. 
it's a ship it needs to work on its own maybe one or two ships most with it the americans always use it as a battle fleet there's always four or five destroyers six seven frigates two three submarines that go with a battle fleet like that now in order for you to have this top up capability of an aircraft carrier you first need to have excellent sea denial because the aircraft carrier is the icing on the cake i'm simplifying it a bit but that's kind of the thing so you need to get this whole sea denial right first and then you go in for aircraft carriers second when you're going in for aircraft carriers see there there are different kinds of aircraft carriers there's the british and french aircraft carrier which are built only one or two of them are built knowing full well that they are in an alliance and they are not going to be used for extremely high end operations extre- against extremely high end states unless they are operating with the american fleet okay or they are used against extremely low end states so for example france can easily go to, uh, off the syrian coast and intimidate syria knowing full well that 40 rafales on board the charles de gaulle is more than a match for the 300 odd uh, of uh, obsolete fighters of the syrian air force same logic applied to the falklands war you could send 20 30 sea harriers because the falklands were so far away from argentina and whatever they were going to send your harriers were superior in close combat to them and the harriers shot the living daylights out of uh, the french mirages and the super entendants so that was great now what happens on top of this uh you look at an indian capacity first of all you don't want to coordinate anything with america so you know your mig 29s and the gorshkov will be completely incompatible with any american naval operation your lca and domestic carrier may and then if you get a third plane so first there's economies of scale you're going to have three aircraft carriers with three different planes one will have a russian plane one will have an indian plane one will have an american or french plane so no economies of scale you're blow, you're wasting your money again next who are you going to use it against they're too weak to be your for see for every one deployment you need to have two ships in port remember for every three ships you can only deploy one mm. uh that's the way it is uh they go out then one gets into uh uh, uh onward patrol the other is kept in deep uh, maintenance kind of thing so they keep circling out and you need three crews so uh, uh three ships three crews things like that anyway so all of this happening you send one aircraft carrier against pakistan no localized capacity pakistani air force is stronger than one aircraft carrier that you send who are you going to send it against iran no they are stronger against one aircraft carrier probably even against two uh, saudi arabia no they are stronger qatar no they are stronger uae no they are stronger uh so who can you actually use it against bangladesh madagascar uh maldives maldives is very scared of our aircraft carriers i can tell you that seychelles uh mauritius terrible state terrorist state we need to invade and regime change mauritius right now uh, uh tanzania horrible country uganda uh, not even uganda they are not a, a seaport country somalia the somali pirates are shit scared of our aircraft carriers yemen failed state very scared of our aircraft carriers all the people you can use it against you have much better le- less cheap uh, less expensive options to use against all the people you can't use it against are far far ahead of you in terms of well i mean they're more powerful than you than the localized air power of an aircraft carrier it's a very badly thought out plan thank you next question is from chaitanya ysk should indian police constable be given pistols rather than bayonets yes yes but see along with pistols you also need training boss it's not just pistols you can't give them laws that they don't understand pistols are a part of a whole police reform process you need to separate the investigative from the enforcement you need to expand both investigation and enforcement you need to improve salaries and training you need to insist on body cameras 
you have to have very strict rules of engagement which both protect the cop and the public today what happens with the cops is what happens with the army as well they get scapegoated for the incompetence of the commanding officer and that is why cameras are important which is why all police officers will oppose cameras because they want the ability to scapegoat people politicians will also oppose it because they want the ability to scapegoat the police and in that matrix yes pistols are important but will pistols by themselves solve the problem they won't solve anything arun gupta wants to know hey abhijit you once mentioned that name fay disuza do you think her reports are fair because she has played a key role in spreading a lot of fake news yes i like fay disuza she she if you actually she balances her programs very well she has an opinion so you know she doesn't do what nidhi rajdan used to do when fay disuza runs a program if you notice she will actually bring just as good right wing weight to a program used to now she no longer runs it but two years back when she did she used to uh but then she's very biased in her own opinion which is fine i'm very biased in my opinion she's very biased in his opinion who isn't biased so that is completely different as opposed to say ndtv right left and center and nidhi rajdan where you know you would have four people from the left three of whom would be masquerading as center and mind you the kind of people that they used to call the center were a uh, hard right of karl a uh, hard left of karl marx and pol pot <laughs> they would be masqueraded around as centrists so it used to be a 4 is to 1 ratio the right winger they would choose you know there's a tamil word vadigatna muttal filtered uh, fool ha huh? so it, it uh, it's it's called a distilled idiot what uh, what brandy what cognac is to champagne you know it takes about 5 6 bottles of champagne to produce one small bottle of cognac that right wing fellow will be to idiocy that he's a distillate he's a extraordinarily potent distillate of stupidity will be brought so they will get four times the amount of talk time this fellow will get only one uh, amount of talk plus even in that one amount one portion talk that he gets nidhi would interrupt 50% of what he had to say so she is very fair that way <laughs> after that her politics i mean all of us have our politics boss next question from mysore 356 i think we have answered this partly is another party needed on the right to preserve and propagate ideas like free market and business friendliness bjp isn't doing it evidently bjp is as left as congress has ever got if not a little more no improvement to ease of business or free markets is congress minus gandhi's better yes any day the gandhis have to go the congress minus the gandhis now is a better alternative than the bjp the problem is there is going to be no congress minus the gandhis let's be clear about that it's it's one of those things where you know it's uh, it's like gangrene it's like gangrene that has already spread too far where you have to chop off half your body in order to improve but if you chop off half the body the you, there's a 50% chance of you dying now so there's nothing you can do it's it's um uh, the congress is finished unfortunately where that new party is going to come minus the gandhis we don't really know uh it is what it is but if you look at many of the chief ministers around today they are all they have all come out from under the banyan tree that is the congress yes they are uh, mamta uh, banerji himanta biswa sharma now himanta biswa sharma uh, the uh, manipur chief minister what's his name i forget tripu mm. no the tripura chief minister or the manipur chief minister and pema kandu mm. arunachal right right, right. right. Uh, they have all come from under the congress tree and mind you they are the only ones that actually look after their own people Hemant Biswal Sharma looks after his own people. In Bengal, the one guy who was looking after his own, the only BJP guy looking after his own people was Shapan Das Gupta. But he sits in too, Delhi. At that too, yeah. he had to plead, and nobody was listening to him. Hmm. 
Shubhendu mm. Adhikari was actually on the ground looking after his own people. Mm. Why? Because he's come from the TMC, which again has come from the Congress. In BJP, there is no one. They can win elections. That's about it. They can't run a country. They don't even respect their own party workers. It's turned yeah. into the very worst kind of uh, Nehruvian party. It is no longer about ideology. It's about an individual. Kshitij Agarwal wants to know, how good is Korean KFX and its successors in comparison to the other aircrafts offered in MMRCA? It has a lot of inherent flaws in it. Remember, it was built as a technology demonstrator, uh, more as an economic stimulator, sorry, not technology demonstrator for Korean industry. And it's going to be procured in limited numbers. They wanted to test certain basic technologies, which was uh, stealth. The problem is it is not big enough to carry anything internally. So all its weapons are external, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of stealth. So that's a fundamental design flaw. Uh, you know, they could have made it single engine and put all the extra uh, uh, room for a double engine towards weapons. They could have split it half and half and made weapons out of it like the F-35 does. They didn't do that. There are fundamental flaws with it. Um, and contrasting to the MRCA, it would be superfluous. It would be superfluous because it would be as good as an MRCA with really no stealth addition if you're carrying all the weapons externally. Shalab Pradhan wants to know, can India become a major player in electronics and semiconductor industry after the introduction of production-linked incentive scheme by Go GOI, GOI? No. See, you're looking at just one scheme. A scheme doesn't make a great country. It's a whole network of issues that makes a great country. Do you have the labor force to upgrade your thing to the required level? Do you have the regulatory mechanisms that will allow you to do it? Will you, do you have the labor laws that will let you do it? Etc. 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 So there are lots of things. Uh, that go into becoming something big like that. Um, here's a good question. Why has Subramaniam Swami been so sidetracked by this government? Is it because his opinions and call to action are too out there for diplomatic government? Hmm. Look, Modi loves third raters. I give you Amitabh Kant. I give you Jay Shankar. They say all the right things. They do nothing. Plus Modi's, uh, plus Swami is very outspoken. So what are you going to do? They don't want. Everything has to be subsumed to the personality cult. And let's be clear, we're running a personality cult here. This is no longer the BJP that was a party of ideology and ideals. It's a personality cult. It's become one. That's it. Even um, the smart here, ministers aren't given agency. The decisions are written at the PMO. They ju it's just given to them for their signature. That's it. Handed down. Handed down. Last question for the day. Aryan wants to know, why is the aesthetic knowledge of Indians so low? As a visual designer, I can clearly feel the difference while dealing with nationalities slash clients. Mm, very good question. I have not been able to decipher that. Uh, you know, uh, sometime back in some other video chat, I had said that the Vidhana Saudha in Karnataka was actually a very, very bad imitation of the Southern Railways building in Chennai. You go look at the Southern Railways building. It is an exquisite granite building, beautiful proportions, uh, very, very pretty. Uh, you go look at the Vidhana Saudha. It has all kinds of sticky, funny ends coming out of it, which it, it, it's sort of an imagined glorious past, which really isn't. 
and you go on the interior the kind of ugly paints that they've used purple psychedelic purple psychedelic uh, ugly green uh, ugly yellow on the roof and what not etc etc i don't even know what they were thinking and i got attacked so badly for saying that saying that it's not aesthetic i don't know where aesthetics come from but it's clearly cultural right how does a country like japan that has exquisite aesthetic sense within the house have such bad external aesthetic sense like japan is a very Jap- japanese cities are extremely ugly if you go to them right on the other hand you go to western cities there's clearly a public aesthetic sense uh you look at chinese aesthetics in hong kong they're extraordinarily sophisticated Chinese aesthetics in Singapore are very very sophisticated but Chinese aesthetics in China are not sophisticated at all they are horrendous Chinese aesthetics in Taiwan it's a mixed bag 70% of it is horrendous 30% of it is exquisite it's um i really don't know what the answer to it is i've uh, you know i've literally tried looking for answers to this several several times i don't i don't get it like even indian interior designers i think i've complained on your program shri or was it somebody else's program several several times that on my instagram there's only two three indian interior design companies that are good one is called beyond design somewhere in delhi the other is krishna mehta which is not my style because it's over the top uh, uh uh clutter but it's very aesthetic you know you can have be extremely colorful and extremely cluttered and still be very aesthetic but we can do n- neither we have to be extremely cluttered over the top and completely unaesthetic about it so i don't know i sus- I I I don't even have a theory of it because I haven't studied enough. But Aryan, if you could please connect with me, we can sit and uh, if you could, Shri, if you could please give him my email or something like that. I will do that. I will do that. And we need to come and ideate this and um, think up why the Indian aesthetic is so atrocious that not one single building built after the British left us. let's put it this way britain did a lot less damage to india than the modern indian architect has <laughs> well that brings us to a close for today's program as always it's a pleasure having you abhijit on our channel we learned a lot of things at least i did and i'm sure our viewers got their money's worth and we will be back again next monday same time same location do not forget to subscribe to p guru's channel and this time i will say it first vel vel vetri vel thank you very much for joining abhijit you stole my line vel vel vetri vel please remember vel vel vetri vel is my uh, ipr anybody stealing it will be soon sued for ipr violation only i can use it thank you vel vel vetri vel and one more thing one other guy with ex- excellent design sense who goes back to uh, Uh, our traditions benny kuriakos follow him as well he does traditional uh, chetinad kerala houses and very very pretty so yes vel 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 okay last question uh, last thing uh, was it sabrina merchant about uh, the person who was doing yes, the tickets yes sabrina merchant that i think uh, one sec let, let me just google uh, let me just yeah. quickly google uh, i think yes sabira merchant sabira merchant sabira no. merchant sabira merchant yes, yes. okay sabira merchant uh, was it uh yes sabira merchant that's it that's uh, can you no you have to put oh yeah, yeah, yeah i remember now i remember now right 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 yeah. yes 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 beautiful beautiful yes yes all sabira right merchant, so yes. who got it who who announced uh, sachin sachin my my guy editor okay in, yes sachin, in right? sachin. Yeah. thank you yes sabira <laughs> merchant she's the editor right. and, uh, this thing trainer yes yes wonderful and again we'll be back to uh, next week same time same location namaskar vel 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 vel